Beverly, did you have a comment? No, not me. Sorry, I'm I'm a little late chiming in here. Okay. Um, but I am brand new, and so everything that I learn is important, right? Yeah. Okay. So um, we're going to get started here in just a minute. I'm Dave Parks, and I'm the chair of uh, this year's Real Estate Accelerate program. It was formerly called the Real Estate Rookies, and we really changed the emphasis because. This is really just about how to accelerate or take the next step in your business. And one of the topics that we're going to talk about today is going to be the old way you farmed, which still has some merit and not to say not to do that. And then a new concept called farming your network space. And um, I am very pleased to have with us this morning, Kevin Trimble. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, Kevin does work in our company, Parks and Weisberg, but that's not why he's here. Okay. Um, Kevin's a retired Marine Lieutenant Colonel, and he and I first met about 30 years ago, I think. I think actually it was about 24, 26, 24 years ago in Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, I was in Marine recruiting at the time, and Kevin checked in to be the new officer selection officer at Ohio State University. And we sat down and we started having a conversation, and Kevin will probably tell you about that in a minute. But at the end of the day, that became a process of us becoming very close and getting to know each other, et cetera. And uh, Kevin is, has been a battalion commander in combat. He has been on recruiting duty. He's been an operations officer, a plans person. Um, he's been around people and sales his whole life. Um, and what he brings to us this morning is a very unique perspective on how to farm your own network space. So before he kicks that off and we talk about that, um, I want to take a minute to discuss for anybody who doesn't remember or doesn't know what the old method of farming looked like. So could I have the next slide, Tasha? So in the old process of farming, right, you would pick a neighborhood, okay, and you would try to earn the respect and trust of the people in that neighborhood by going around and doing door flyers and walking and direct mail and sponsoring events, et cetera. And back when I was in the Marines, I lived in California in a neighborhood like this. And even though I'd been around real estate my whole life, there was a guy who came and knocked on the doors every Saturday morning for three years and because he did that and because he earned my wife's trust, when I was deployed to Japan, she called me and said, hey, I know we're going to Cincinnati, so I'm selling the house. And I said, oh, that's great. I'll help with it when I get back. And she said, no, I'm hiring Luke. And I said, why are we doing that? She said, he's been farming the neighborhood for three years. He knows it better than you do. And that's what we're doing. And I said, OK, honey, that sounds good to me. OK, that was the old method of farming. OK, and there's still some merit to that process. And what most people would tell you, though, is that farming process is a two to three year process mm -hmm. to get a 10 to 15 to 20% market share in a neighborhood. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so in that old process, you would start with a big market and you would hone in on areas. Next slide, please. And you would try to find a focus to study some trends, to know the area. Next slide, please. And then you would narrow that focus down to something that really fit your mindset, what you were good at, what you understood. And the other thing that we would teach you in farming, the traditional way is you've got to pick an area with velocity. Because if I farm a neighborhood that sells three houses every three years, what's the point? The math doesn't work. It's not that I don't love the people. It's not that I can't, there's no chicken there, right? OK, but by the same token, you would want to go places that you understood people. You would want to get in your comfort zone. So typically what somebody would do is, OK, if I lived in the woods of St. Thomas or if I lived in, um, say, St. Regis Park, I would farm those areas because I knew them. I knew the people there. I understood them. Or, for example, years ago, I built houses in a subdivision in Highview. 
And because I built in that subdivision, I got to know the other neighboring subdivisions and I mailed to those subdivisions and I got ancillary business from that because I understood the neighborhood. Does that make sense? So that's the old way of farming. And that has merit and nobody's trying to say you shouldn't still necessarily pick a farm area or two if that's part of your business model. But what Kevin wants to share with you is a whole new way of farming. Next slide, please. Just go ahead and move on from that one, please. Okay, so now we talked about neighborhoods. Now we're gonna turn it over to Kevin. I'm gonna let him tell you a little bit about his background and take it over from here. He's in total control of the slides and this should be a great morning. If you have a question or something you'd like him to specifically address or clarify, please type it into chat and Tasha and I will be monitoring chat and I will um, interrupt if I need to interject something. Kevin, you don't have to worry about the chat side. All right, Kevin, take it away. All right, good morning, thank you. and. Um... I'm, I'm glad to be here. And as Dave said, my background, um, probably not very, you know, different than any of yours, especially if you've uh, had a different life than now your, your realtor life, uh, how does that change? So uh, I was born and raised here in Louisville in St. Matthews. Matter of fact, right across about 100, 200 yards from where I sit, went to Wagner High School, went to college in Danville, Kentucky, and then I spent 24 years in the Marine Corps um, moved 10 times, so um, I understand um, real estate and I understand the pains with moving, um, but lived in, been to 28 countries, lived in eight states. But the one thing, um, and this is why I moved home, was um, I never left Louisville. Uh, I may have been gone for 24 years, Turn down a but bit. Louisville and Kentucky um, always remained close. Thank you. I'm a huge fan of social media. That That's a way to maintain contact. And, you know, you remember 2008, 2009, um, you know, get on Facebook, and I think it started with MySpace, but I'm a huge believer in that, you know, use for the right reasons to, to keep in touch, to, to build that network, and more importantly, to cultivate and maintain that network. Well, when I came to real estate a couple of years back, it really is about 18 months ago, you know, Dave and I had talked about, uh, I was living in Florida, and it was kind of tough because I lived on a house on a cul-de-sac with a pool in Tampa, Florida. And I convinced my wife to move to Louisville. And that was because I wanted to raise my children here. We have two boys and I want to raise them in the network. I want to raise them, you know, on this farm. So one of the things when I moved home, learned about, you know, the real estate business. And I kind of looked at Dave and said, hey, this isn't much different than what we did in recruiting. You know, this isn't much different than um, what I did at times in Afghanistan. You know, when you're, um, you know, talking to people. You know, what are you doing? You're talking to people. Why are you talking to people? Determine their needs. Um, as you all know, um, as, as, as newer agents, all of us, we learn in our basic sales class like, like we do here, step one is you establish rapport. And establishing rapport is literally building the bridge over what we call the trust divide. But establish rapport off the bat, then start asking those questions and determine um, somebody's needs. What do they need? Do they need anything from you? That'll come later. Um, and But once you determine that, how can you support that need? And those are the steps we go over. And we go over, over those in our life if you really think about it. And I bring that up because one of the things we all keep hearing um, is, hey, we're going to a networking event. We're going to network. We're going to network. And as Dave talked about farming a neighborhood, well, if you farm a neighborhood, um, you pretty much bring one thing to the table. You're going house to house to knock on the door and say, I'm a realtor. And you don't know, you may not know these people, but you're trying to build, you know, bridge that trust divide. But what do you bring to the table? Well, a real network that I've found out is it's an open system of reciprocal relationships. So think about that. When you come into my network, um, I don't. Yeah, oh, great, you're a realtor. I'm, you might be the greatest realtor forever, but if you're in the network, if that's all you can provide is, 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 is real estate, well, you know what? That's not, you know, that's not very conducive to what networking and relationships and trust is all about. And I bring that up when we talk about farming your sphere because literally when you go into a network and a networking event and you want to uh, uh, spread you know, your message and 
literally we talk about getting business, but what it comes down to is somebody wants you to open your Rolodex and open your Rolodex first, because what, then that will help you kind of get that, you know, added business. So I bring that up because as we talked about with farming, Dave showed the big map a little bit and you're going to observe. And if you see on your slide right now, when I moved here as a test, started listening about farming. I said, hey, wait a second. This makes, I understand this. So I drew out just a sample of the people I knew. And these are the people that I knew in Louisville that um, I was going to go reach out to. So I started doing that. And I'm like I said, I'm from here. And if you see the circles in there, well, there's a little red circle. That's the inner, inner, inner circle. And in that circle are my wife, my two children, my boys, and my best friend since fifth grade, who actually, I, coincidentally, my wife picked out a house and it turned out to be next door to my best friend since fifth grade. So how, how awesome is that? It's, it's actually awkward, but that's that inner circle. Um, and then I have another inner circle. That other inner circle, call it the circle of trust. Um, I would like to think I'm very fortunate that my circle of trust is bigger than some others. And the reason is, is because the average time I've known somebody in that circle is about 30 years. And I'm talking never left touch. I see those people, I touch those people. And here's the other thing I think you all will understand about circles of trust is I've got family members that aren't in that circle. They're on the outside edge. Not that I don't love them, but they just, you know, it's about trust. And when you do that exercise, and we'll talk about this, write down everybody you know, and just start here alone. Everybody you know, just every time you can do that, do it. And then put some circles in there. And then ask yourself, if I called this person right now and said, hey, I need you to come over and help me move a refrigerator, would they would they do it? Hey, I need you to come over and help me with something. Would they do it? But here's most important. If they asked you to come over, would you do it? And why? And it should, the why should be because that's what you do. I bring that up because this is my neighborhood right now. This is my big map of Louisville right now that I'm observing as a sample. Next slide, please, Tasha. Okay. Now, as we talked about focusing and then isolating here, one of the things I looked at my network in my big sphere is, is, is that big map. Um, okay, what do these people, and this is just a sample, because you'll have many. Um, what do these people do? And we're gonna talk about this from a business perspective in a professional aspect. What do the people in my sphere do? Well, my family, is my family. Now, some of my family members are, are, are you know, some one's an electrician, some, you know, I've got a family member that is uh, a DJ, things like that. But what does my family do? I just put them as family. But for example, you start broad. I put doctors in medical. Okay, well, we all know some doctors. Everybody knows pharmaceutical sales rep. Well, break that down even more. Are you selling pills? Or are you selling something to fix your shoulder? You know, how does that work? You're, a doctor, you're an orthopedist, you're a urologist, you're an allergist, you're a pediatrician. Oh, by the way, you meet families, they have kids, especially when they move in town. What's a person? Hey, do you know a good pediatrician? You know, it's really comforting. You say, yes, I do. And, but you break that down big, start anything medical. And then you got lawyers. Well, I've got lawyers there, and that's anybody that's involved in law to include paralegals, um, yeah, I've got a friend from high school who's a judge in there. Teachers, big thing. Teachers are huge because, hey, it's not just about schools. It's about, hey, has anybody noticed tutoring going on right now? There's a lot of kids that have missed about 18 months of school. Um, it's good to know some teachers, but this is an example. And then financial advisors. And I put these guys, well, <clears throat> that, you know, whether you're an FA, you're a stockbroker, you work at a bank. I put these guys in here, and guys and gals, and then we have insurance, different types of insurance, and building, contractor, anything to do with a house, anything to do with a hammer and a nail or improving a house. Well, I put that in there because this is, like I said, focused kind of on a, a real estate professional aspect. The key is, is it's all about relationships, and every time you do that and you write those down, 
ask yourself these questions. How do I know this person? How long have I known this person? Um, how do I communicate with this person? You know, does this person know what I do right now? And you break that down because the whole purpose is you want to find out that what do you have as far as relationships that can help other people? Go to the next slide, please, Tasha. And this is just a sample of it breaking down even farther, and here's why. So um, took that little sphere, broke it down even more, and then I said, all right, well, how can I connect people? Well, if I talk to you at your house because I'm farming your neighborhood and I'm standing there and I'm Kevin Trimble Realtor, well, I've never met you before, but I want to introduce myself as Kevin Trimble Realtor. Well, there's kind of an understanding. Okay, if I need to buy or sell my house, I'll call you. Well, eventually you try to, you know, long-term build up a relationship where you can, oh, if you need anything else, I can help you there too. But when you have your network of trust, um, when you have your network of relationships, because that's, you know, that's what real estate's about anyway, is you're going to influence people. You don't influence transactions. You influence relationships. And when you talk about farming and you organize and you isolate, that's when you connect and cultivate. Um, one of the things we talk about is having a purity of purpose. When you meet people is your total focus. Hey, I want to go meet these people to hand out my card so they know I'm a realtor. Um, that, you know, may work for some people. I don't think it is uh, uh, conducive to longevity at all. As we know, we've got some very experienced agents on here. We've got some, a lot of rookie agents on here like myself that you can look markets up and down. A lot of us are experienced consumers of real estate. I've seen markets up and down. I mean, Dave can tell you, you know, you know, I remember, you know, I bought a house for this and they said, hey, you're moving to Okinawa, Japan and I had to sell it for that. OK, so I understand that market. Well, the thing is, is that um, relationships can bridge all those gaps. And that's when you go in to meet someone. The big thing is, how are you? What can I do to help you? What do you need? And it starts with the best thing that you can provide is access to your relationships. And I use this example, Buzz, for we have like one here on the green line. I've got a friend named Kaylee and she's a coach and she's a coach slash personal trainer. So if you want to get faster, she'll make you fast. If you want to get lean and mean and skinny, she will help you get lean and mean and skinny. That's what she does. But I've connected her with a doctor friend of mine. OK, because the doctor friend has a bunch of clients that come in and they want to get fake knees. They want to get fake hips Well, they meet them. And one of the things with him is he says, listen, I will help you. I will do a knee replacement on you as long as you first you lose 30 pounds. And what's their next question? Well, how am I going to lose 30 pounds? He's like, you're going to call this coach and she's going to help you lose 30 pounds. Well, did I never heard the word real estate in there. I never heard the word Kevin Trimble in there anywhere. Um, it was two people helping people that help clients and help patients. And I'm fortunate that I was able to connect those people. Um, is a deal going to come out of that? I don't know, maybe eventually. But I know that there's about three to four degrees of people that are benefiting um, from opening a relationship. You know, um, one of the things when you look down, you'll have within your network as you break it down, you'll be surprised that you'll have uh, multiple people have multiple roles and multiple hats and multiple talents. And you know that it's the same relationship because it's about people, but they have multiple talents. So for example, um, one of the things I, I came up with a category, I call it entertainment. So I've got a friend who's a DJ. I've got a friend who's a chef. Well, the thing that friends the chef is, you know, he does banquets and everything else, but he knows a whole lot of people. And we've got other friends that, um, are, are very successful in business, but on the weekends, they're in a band. Well, I put, the, I put them underneath entertainment as well because you never know, hey, I'm going to hire a band. They're a cover band. They're really awesome if you haven't heard it. Um, and I bring this up because you're going to ask yourself, well, I know a lot of people, but I haven't talked to them. I don't know where they are. Um, well, I'll tell you, number one, um, that's not a good excuse. You can find anybody you want in the year 2021. Um, you can pretty much find anybody. And 
especially if it's local, and I'm going to focus on local, um, I'm a big fan of social media. That's a great way to find out. Stay in touch. You'll be surprised at how um, somebody be excited to hear from you. But a lot of people say, okay, well, I've been gone. I was gone for 25 years, and I came back, though I kept in touch with a lot of people. I'm back now. So how am I going to find people? And this is something I want you to really think about. And Go to the next slide, please. I'll get to the case study, but I want you to think about Evan, this. Yes. I'll interrupt you for one minute. Before yeah. you go to this case study, um, we had a couple of people that joined into the call a little late. So I want to recap a couple of key points you made so they can write them down before you go to the next thing. So Kevin said that farming your network is an open system of reciprocal relationships. It comes from the concept of giver's gain or reciprocity that says, if I do for others, they will want to do for me. The other thing he pointed out is that it's easier to create those reciprocal relationships with people who already trust you. So when we're contrasting the old farming methods to farming your network or your sphere, it's all based on the fact that I already have a relative level of trust. And he talked about the fact that you've got like three circles of that which we'll share those slides for you, okay? His next thing that he said is that you're going to connect and cultivate. In other words, just like in farming, you got to plant the seeds and keep putting water and keep fertilizing and keep touching, which is going to bring up a, com a point that we're going to talk about in a minute, which is going to be how are we going to stay in touch and how frequently should we stay in touch? Now, if you're on the call and you're wondering that piece, I'll cover that toward the end, but I just wanted to recap those key points that Kevin's covered so far so that now when he talks about this farming case study, it frames it, okay? All right, go, Kevin. Um, and Dave, before I get into the case study, Tasha, can we go back one slide, please? So just go back one slide, please, Tasha. There you go. No, back one. Go to slide nine, I believe. Right there, stop. Okay, and, and I bring, here's something um, that some folks asked me. They said, well, I haven't talked to people or I forgot who they were. I don't know where they are. Um, and it's amazing uh, that if you can go back and I use this as an example. So I moved home in the summer of 2019 and yes, I, my, I was very fortunate to have a, a, a core right. sphere, to have a core sphere um, from, uh, you know, social media. I've got okay. another core group, of, a group text with uh, 14 people on it. And by the way, it's a bunch of 50 year olds and we're all, I would like to say, pretty successful and happily married and this, that and the other. Yet we have a group text like a bunch of high school, you know, eighth grade girls that okay. goes off all the time to talk about things. And as you start looking about, okay, analyze and dissect your life. So here's an example that I use. I went through everything from Facebook. Okay, who are my friends on Facebook? I went through my contact list on my phone. All right. And that's, by the way, that's difficult because most of us, that's 20 years old. And you're going through where are they? Who are they? But then what I did is I started going through everything from yearbooks. Now, for example, and went all the way back to, I found my sixth grade yearbook from uh, 1981 or 80, 1982. And one of the things I put in and looking people up, you know, wow, some of them was a funeral director. Obviously there's coaches and teachers, people that are in the media, media can help you, people that run charities. Um, but here's what was amazing is, for example, if anybody on this call um, needs to go rent a jet, like you got to, you know, because you're going to go jet setting after you get a whole bunch of deals here real soon. I got a guy now that can help you rent an executive jet. And I had not talked to him in over 30 years. I reached out to him on social media and we ended up talking at the phone and we had coffee one day at a Mexican restaurant. And you know what? I played football with him when I was in like sixth grade, but I found him. I went through and I reached out and I connected the dots. 
And just think about that for finding people. So with that, I want to give you a little case study. Tasha, go to the next slide, please. Okay. Now, have you ever heard the term, um, uh, like, it's kind of like having your first kiss be from a supermodel, okay? Everything after that's kind of like, yeah, whatever. Well, here's what's crazy. So I haven't been in real estate long, and my focus is supporting and coaching and training. And most of the deals I do are referrals. And I love referrals because I call a friend, I talk to them, and next thing you know, hey, can you help me with this? I said, yeah, I'm going to link you up with this other agent. And next thing you know, um, a month and a half later, you got a check. It's, it's pretty awesome. But something happened. Somebody asked me, say, hey, Kevin, we've got these folks coming in um, for our company, and they're moving in, and I need you to be their realtor. And I'm like, really? He said, yeah, I need you to be the realtor. So in January, I was fortunate with, uh, with uh, a splitted deal with, with probably the best realtor I've ever seen. And she walked me through the process. And this is the first house I've ever closed on as a buyer agent. And I'm going to tell you, like I said, it's kind of like your first kiss being from a supermodel. I bring this up because I want to show you how this happened. Okay. So here I'd moved to Louisville, and as I told you, I did a sample of, oh, everybody I know, I've got to farm my network. I've got to farm. If I'm going to get business, you know, my kids got to eat. I've got a 13-year-old boy and a 10-year-old boy, and many of y'all know about that. So what happened is this gentleman right here, let's call him David. And David is one of my best friends, and that's David now in 1982. I'm number 20. Um, he's bald now, but he was number 82 and he had long hair. And we were, we thought we were tough guy football players back then. Um, well, he walked over to my house cause he's my next door neighbor as well. And he said, Hey, we have this family moving in from, we're transferring someone from Texas. And, um, I said, Hey, you could be the realtor. And I said, really? He said, yeah. He said at first the management team was like, well, we already have a realtor that we use. And I want to bring this up because he said, yeah, well, Trimble just got his license. I, what about him? And they said, well, we, what about the realtor we have? And he told him, he said, well, let's think about three months ago. So about, no, about six months prior, if you remember when COVID happened, a lot of people, companies, very successful companies were looking for ways to motivate their, 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 their sales teams or their employees. So they were bringing in motivational speakers. Well, I was fortunate that before I worked here, I worked with, uh, with, some, with some people. One of them is very influential, motivational speaker. And he was able to agree, made some calls, wrote some emails. So my friend's company was able to get a discount on having this gentleman give a motivational speech via Zoom to his company. So, wow, fast forward a couple months, they're sitting around the management table and they have a, a, a new, uh, one of their employees moving in and he says, Trimble's got his license. And they said, well, I don't, you know, let's just use the other agent. And he said, yeah, but no, Trimble helped us out. I bring that out. That wasn't the reason I helped them out. But that was the reciprocation from that. So that's where the lead came from. And here's the next thing. As you all know by now, when you're taking buyers around, you've got to, you know, you're quickly trying to overcome that trust divide, establish rapport, but more importantly, determine what they need. What do they want? Who's the decision maker? Is it, is it which, which spouse is the one that is, is, is saying, no, we're going here, we're going there? Are you focusing on that? Well, I was with this family and they said they were from Texas and they used these words. We're used to shooting dove with our socks on. Well, as you know, that means they can stand on the back porch and shoot doves. Well, okay, well, part of Jefferson County's out. Maybe we'll look at Oldham County. We went back and forth and then they started thinking about, well, I'm, I don't think I want to cut all this grass on this farm. And then I heard the word, but you know what? I wouldn't mind being near a golf course. So did some research. Hey, here's a house that's been for sale. And I'm not sure if they're going to like it, but I take them to this house. And it's in a neighborhood with a golf course, um, a little country club. And, all, and I'm thinking, they probably are not going to like this. They're used to a farm and all this. Well, they get in this house and we start walking around. And I'm going to tell you, um, she, the, 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 the spouse, she says, I like this. They start both going, yeah, this could work. They're talking about, look at the basement. We're going to have a game room. Oh, we're, this would be great for a game room. Hey, what's this third garage? And I was like, oh, that's for your golf cart. Oh, really? 
Now, how far away is the golf course? Well, it's a mile up by the country club. And right then and there, and I'm, I'm serious, I took out my phone and I had a thought, and I have a friend down here, and if you see this arrow, his name is Jeff. And Jeff lives in this neighborhood, and he's lived in this neighborhood his entire life. Because the last time I ever saw Jeff was- Next slide, Tasha. Prior. Excuse me? There you go. Tasha, the last... that slide up. Okay. Yeah, next slide with the golf course. Go down two more, Tasha. Right there. Because the last time I ever saw my friend Jeff was in that neighborhood when he was a kid. And I used to come from my little Leavenhurst Square Foot house in St. Matthews down to his house near the golf course and we'd run around, but he still lives in the neighborhood. So what happened was I got on, on a, I mean, hope and a prayer. I had talked to him on the phone. I, would you know, text him before, but I text him and said, hey, Jeff, I've got this family. They really like this neighborhood. What are the chances I can get them a tour of the club and all that? And he said, when? I said, in the next 30 minutes. And literally on a text, he said, hey, stand by. And he came back. He said, so-and-so's going to meet you. And I'm going to tell you, there was never, you know, was it, it, it was amazing because took the family through. They liked it. They ended up buying the house. And I was like, wow. So as you know, put an offer on the house, offer acceptable. Well, now we're going to do inspections. Well, millions of, uh, you know, home inspectors, but this one we talked about HVAC. And I'm going to go through this quickly, but right off the bat, hey, we need an HVAC. And I said, okay, we've got the HVAC. I went back into the network, and if you can see there, I've got a friend named Alex. His company owns a heating and cooling. Uh, his family owns a heating and cooling company. And you know what? Called him up. Hey, you got it. That's great. Alex, I've known him for 25 years. Back to showing this house. One of the key needs was we're going to have a game room. And we were able, um, uh, the night before we wrote the offer, they kept thinking about a game room, and we had about a two-hour window to our next meeting to set things up. I called a friend that I coach football with, and you see that arrow, and we coach football together. And I said, hey, I've got a family, and they're going to buy a house, and they really want to get a game room. And literally, he said on the phone, I'm turning around now. I'll meet you at the office. So he has a company that sells game room equipment, outdoor equipment. So we go to his office and Kevin, I'm yes. going to interrupt you again. I apologize. We're having trouble keeping up with your slides. Tasha, can you move forward about next this? slide, please? Yeah. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. And that was probably on, no back up one, Tasha. There you go. Back up one slide, Tasha. Next one. Sorry well, about that. Sorry, I well, that's to go okay. Back. Difficulties. It, it just and that's probably my fault, Tasha. I didn't give you the signal. I'll tell you when to stop. But like I said, the key is using the network. I got a lead from a friend. Next slide, Tasha. You know, HVAC inspection. Someone that I've known twenty five years. Next slide, Tasha. The family wanted a game room, took them to a place that said, hey, we'll support you. And what's exciting about that is after closing, um, they I, I found out through my friend that they came in and they bought a pool table, a shuffleboard table, a card table, and four chairs, which, oh, by the way, just so everyone knows, it's not just commodities to build housing that are delayed. They're not going to get the shuffleboard or the pool table until probably May. Next slide. Okay, so one of the things that you all know when moving, and I've moved 10 times, the craziest time of moving is the day when the movers are there. Why? Because things are going nuts. Doors are open. You know, you've got food. People want to help. Uh, sometimes uh, people want to come over and, and say, hey, I'm here to help you, but they end up trying to, like, you know, take charge, and that doesn't work out. But the one thing is food. So one of the uh, ideas I came up with is that I want to make, my one of my signature uh, events or one of my signature, um, you know, call it a gift. But for that client is I thought it'd be great to provide meals on moving day and on those days when the movers and things are crazy. So what came up with is anytime I think about buying meals, I have a friend that I've known 
since seventh grade. We met in football, and by the way, he's one of the guys on the group tech. He's a chef, and it's it's amazing because he's done everything from catering weddings. We set him up there, and he's owned his own restaurant. And what he does now is his business is for the working family. He makes meals and puts them, you know, four meals in your in your garage refrigerator on Monday. So when you come home from work, um, there's four meals there. You heat them up Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Well, this same family is now agreed and said, hey, we both work. I like this. They're going to use him as, as a customer from here on out. Why? Because I paid a whole hundred bucks for like two days of meals for a whole family and they love it. And next slide, please, Sasha. Same thing with looking outside. Now, we closed on this house in January, and I didn't think the yard looked very good. And I have a friend who, who actually lives behind me. He's new to my network, so to speak, because he lives behind me, and he's dual role. He's a teacher, and he's a, he owns a landscape business. And I asked him, I said, would you drive out there and give me an idea on what it would cost to, number one, clean it up? Get the leaves out, blow that out, make it look kind of nice, trim, throw a little mulch down. Let me know that now. But also, what would it cost if you were going to cut this for the rest of you, under contract? Because um, you have a double working family, and I think you know they they would rather do that. Turned out, didn't cost very much. They cleaned up the yard, and now they're under contract for this year at least. Um, you know, starting when when the mowing season goes with this friend of mine. So, next slide, please. And then here's the last as an example of this uh, of this one case study. So about a month ago, the clients who are in the house now, they've got the yard mowed, they're pretty happy, they're waiting on their pool table and their shuffleboard. Well, because of the delay, they've decided in the basement, they wanna rip out the carpet that's down there and they wanna put some kind of PVC laminate flooring. And that client from Texas called me and said, hey, do you got anybody in flooring? And you know, this goes back to what I call about the importance of your sphere, of your, and, and the reason is, is because you have skin in the game when you recommend somebody, you recommend somebody, you're saying, I trust this person. And that's how it's got to be yours. And I'll give you an example. I asked, um, I asked Dave, I said, Dave, uh, do you got a flooring person? And he said, he said, yeah, you can use this one. Well, I didn't know those people and I've never met them. And they said, oh, they're, you know, uh, do that. But I called another guy as well. And I said, hey, my friend, Sean. And if you see Sean right there, I've known Sean forever. And Sean, um, like I said, since like eighth grade, I've known Sean. And Sean is a contractor and a builder and this, that, and the other. I said, Sean, when you put in floors, who, who, who's your floor guy? And if you look at the arrow goes over there, he said, my floor guy is Cody. So I gave Cody's information to these clients and I said, you know, let me know. And that's the other thing. When you recommend somebody within your sphere to somebody outside your sphere, make sure you can own it. Because if you can't, don't recommend them. So I made sure the client knew, hey, if you got any problems, let me know. I got it from Sean. I trust Sean. If Sean said the sky is blue, I'm not bringing an umbrella. Okay. It's all about the trust divide. And what was amazing is, um, I got a call the other night and I said, hey, how's things going? And how's things going with Cody? Well, guess what? Cody's knocking it out of the park. Cody is never late. Cody is on time. He is on budget and everything is perfect. And so right now, when I talk about, and this should have been a perforated line and I apologize for my graphics. I went to Wagner, we didn't have PowerPoint then. Um, so this should be an open system. But Cody's now in my sphere. Cody's now my network. And if you go back to the neighborhood network, Cody is my floor guy. Why? Because I called somebody and they sent Cody and Cody delivered. And that's how you bridge the trust the guy divide. You farm your network, farm your neighborhood and go to the next slide, please, Tasha. And I just want to hey, kind of sum up some. Yes. Before you go through this slide, because there are some really key points I want to talk through with you kind of interactively. Uh, we had a few more people who joined kind of in the middle of your last section. So I just want to recap a couple of things again for those people who might have joined in late. Okay. So 
Um, you know, reinforcing things is good for us because the more we hear them, the better we remember them. So step one, this is an open system of reciprocal relationships. And if you think about what Kevin was explaining to you about this case study, okay, not only did he reinforce for that client that he didn't know before, that became an opportunity for him because of something he'd done for somebody else and they reciprocated him by giving him the opportunity, Okay, not only did that reciprocal piece pay off, but now think of all the people that he introduced that person to that then got good service, that then reinforced his value to that seller or buyer in that case, that created and reinforced those reciprocal relationships again, and how he grew his sphere by actually identifying a couple of people he didn't know that he talked to or met from other people that were already inside his inner circle of trust. Okay. And so the other piece he mentioned was network of trust. And the final piece was to always be connecting and cultivating. So I think that that case study really reinforces those three main topics. And for those of you who might've gone on late, I just wanted to make sure I recap them. Now, Kevin's going to talk a little bit about purity of purpose. Okay. And Kevin, I have a specific question about the purity of purpose piece as it relates to real estate, okay? How do you define, before you talk about the, the nuts and bolts of it, how do you define what that means to you? What does it mean to you to have purity of purpose? Um, purity of purpose is, number one, it's about discipline. When you say purity of purpose, it's the why are you doing something? If I'm talking to you solely for the fact that you are a potential real estate deal. Um, that might be a second and third order effect of something. But if my purity of purpose is A to meet you, okay, and after establishing a little bit of rapport and asking you questions, seeing what you need, that to me is if I can help you. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not saying that I'm gonna do everything for free because oh, by the way, I'm not. There's a reason they have you know commissions and cooperating commissions, all right? We're not doing this for free. I'm, that's 100%. But what I found out at, I didn't start in this career till I'm 50 years old. And um, I've done a lot of things in my life. I'm very fortunate that I've done those. Um, yeah, I still need a little extra money. And that's why, you know, it just turns out I, I can do this. But purity of purpose is I'm a firm believer after 25 years of traveling around the world and meeting every culture and immersing myself and understand that, that if you have the right intentions, things will come back. And as we talked about um, purity of purpose and think about the purity, and I bring this up because it's one of the things we talk about is leadership. You're getting a commission to lead clients through a process, okay? There is a leadership aspect as a, I don't know if you're a seller agent or a buyer agent, you're a broker, there's a leadership requirement, okay? You are leading someone. Because if you are going to lead them through, why are they going to pay you? That's why you're getting paid is to lead someone through the process. Well, one of the things over the last 30 years that I've learned is leadership is based on trust, okay? Now, management, a lot of, you know, some managers are good leaders, but managers are about processes, okay? Follow the processes. Leaders are about trust. And here's why. Because I'm going to do what you ask me to do or I'm going to do what you tell me to do because you're going to pay me or because I have a contract, all right? I'm going to follow you if I trust you. So leadership is about trust. Well, where does trust come from? And you heard me mention before, you have to bridge the trust divide. You meet someone in a real estate transaction. You meet them here. Next thing you know, you're sitting across the table at closing and they just sign their name to the largest, you know, uh, transaction that they'll ever have in their life. How, how do you bridge the trust divide? Well, I like to have a 30 year head start on that. But I talk about leadership. I talk about trust. It comes from trust. Well, then it comes from character. And this is where the purity of purpose comes in. In today's environment, if you if you ever heard uh, character is who you are when nobody's looking. And in today's environment, uh, since I don't know, last five, six, seven years, What's kind of sad is that um, no one really talks about it, but there is a requirement for character. There is a requirement because if you 
are different in person than you are on video, um, it's not going to work. You, it, you might be able to pull it off for a little bit. Here's the crazy thing. Three years ago, you could do that. Four years ago, you could do that. Um, if I see you and you don't ever, you know, across the table at a listing presentation and you're like, hey, and you're, you know, gregarious and you're, you're funny and you're nice and you're smiling and you're doing all that. And whether you get the deal or not, the next time I see you, we both happen to be at the same social event and you don't even acknowledge me. Guess what? You're not the same person. You're never going to get my deal. And it back to purity of purpose, it will come back in a negative way. Okay. Because one of the things Dave Parks and I say is, is be nice because life's too short and Louisville's too small. And your network, um, you want it to appear small. The best part is make sure your network's big. And how do you do that? And why do you do that? And that goes back to purity of purpose. Here's a belief that I have that I've discovered, I don't know, over the last two years. You have more leads that go unused, but you have more leads in your memory banks than you could pay for it in, in a year or two years. Um, like Beverly, Beverly, can you hear me? Are you on there? Beverly, you mentioned before. What's Beverly's last name, Dave? I'm sorry, Kevin. Uh, I, I'm, I'm muted. Yeah. Beverly I'm Martell? Just, I was going to ask Beverly a question or somebody else. Here's my question for you, Beverly. I heard you say you're new to real estate. My question for you was, who is your high school prom date? And does your high school prom date know that you're in real estate? Go back um, through your... He does not know. He does not he, know. Good point. So there you is, go. Your, is, is your prom date local? He is. Okay. When was the last time you talked to your prom date? Whew. A long time ago. <laughs> I okay. couldn't even tell you. Well, put that in your back of your head, Beverly, and everybody else. Keep that as an example because we're going to do an exercise. I'm going to challenge you on something. But there are more leads in your memory banks that you can pay for. Um, I would ask if we were in a room, but it'd be uncomfortable. Uh, please stand up if you've ever gotten a call or something in the mail or an email about buying leads. Well, here's the thing. Are you going to buy a relationship? And here we are in the Accelerate version. We're all new to this game. Um, we're building relationships, cultivating relationships. Buying relationships usually don't work. Now, you can buy transactions somehow, but building relationships aren't long-lasting. And the reason I bring that up is those memory banks go through your life. Go back to your school. What's your previous life? What's your previous job? Dave, you gave me a, a, a percentage one time of agents in just Glar, for example, had a previous career before real estate. Well, it's probably 60%, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that previous career doesn't get put in the rearview mirror, throw away in the trunk. That's part of your life. There's relationships in there. Oh, by the way, good relationships, bad relationships. I'll get to that in a second. Um, I asked Beverly about who her high school prom date was. Does everybody know you're in real estate? But more importantly, does everybody know you? Does everybody know who you are? Does everybody know that, you know, do you know people? You know, I'm fortunate in, in that uh, I've got friends. I went, to, I went to private grade school as a kid. I went to public high school. And then I went to a college in, 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 in Kentucky that was smaller than my high school, but I have friends from all, I think I know someone near or close to all 120 counties in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And I, you know, lived all over, but they add up. How do you add that up? And back into the memory bank, have you ever heard the term, there's no such thing as a bad idea. There's no such thing as a bad question. Um, I'm gonna ask you this. Hey, Beverly, since you're my, you're my guinea pig, Beverly, can you name the top three most successful people from your sixth grade class? I cannot. Well, well my, my advice to you is go find out because okay. it, will, it will change your life if you go find out. And the exercise of learning to, of, to how to find out will change your life. Because here's what a lot of people don't understand. Um, there's people in your life from five years ago, 10 years ago, 15, 20 years ago that... Um, you haven't talked to in 30, you know, 20 years. And a lot of us get nervous about, well, I really don't want to call them. I haven't talked to them. 
I don't feel right calling. You know, the key is this, call and check in with them. And as Dave, like we talked about one time, be honest too. Hey, how you doing? I, I haven't talked to you in forever. I'm in real estate now. I just want to let you know. But making sure, reach out. You'll be very surprised at how many people would love to hear from you. You have no idea because it brings something good back into their mind. Here's what also, there's an opportunity. And I'll go to the last slide. The next opportunity is this. Say you reach out to somebody and it might be an opportunity for you to say, hey, Beverly, um, this is Kevin. I know we had talked in 25 years. I, I was just thinking, you know, I know I was a total jerk the last time we talked. I want to apologize, just kind of leave it at that. Here's the deal, whether you ever talk to Beverly or not, or get a transaction from Beverly, or get her into your network or out of your network, it might make you at least feel better. You never, it'll, it'll surprise you. So with that, that said, I'm going to give you an exercise. So do two things this weekend. And I'd be really, uh, next time we get together, have some notes. And, and Tasha will give you my email and phone number, because I will help you in any way I can. Um, I'm learning every day because if you're not growing, you're dying. And if you're learning, you're growing. But one of the things I got to do is exercise because you practice, practice, practice. And step one, um, find a way through your broker where you work, how to buy some leads. You know, go to the lowest amount, to buy some leads. And when you get these leads, call them up. And here's what I'd ask you to ask. Number one, what is your opening? Okay. Number two, do you have anything in common? And I say, what's your opening? Uh, hi, Beverly. Uh, this is Kevin. I saw that you're interested in real estate. Uh, yeah, kind of, sort of. Okay, well, how long is it going to take you to determine if you have anything in common? And the question I would ask is, when well, you bought this lead and you got it, um, hey, can we meet somewhere? Well, yeah, you're going to go meet someone you've never met before. Where are you going to meet them? Um, how do they trust you? How long is it going to take for them to trust you? Um, and then here's what I want to know. That same person at the end of the day says, you know what? I was just looking and I'm not really going to, you know, I don't need anything. But what you would like to say is, hey, listen, but if you know anybody uh, that's interested in real estate, let them give them my information if you wouldn't mind. Well, how many of them are going to do that? I'm willing to bet about not very many. Why? Because they don't know you. They don't trust you. Well, here's exercise step number two. I want you to call three people that you met in middle school. Now, um, Beverly and myself, this, you know, there's, there's a greater gap. A lot of our agents in, in, in this presentation are, you know, it's not too hard. But find somebody that you met in middle school. And oh, by the way, if you can't find their phone number, reach out to me. I'll help you find their phone number. But call three people in middle school and just talk to them. All I want you to do is talk to them. And when you get done talking, I want you to ask this. What was your open? Okay, ask yourself, how did you open? Hey, this is Kevin. You remember me from middle school? You know, how's that going? Did you have anything in common? Because here's the greatest thing that you can do by farming your sphere is you can say things like, hey, you remember that one time? Or, hey, how so and so? And what do you, oh my God, I can't believe that. And then you're going to go back to, hey, you remember that one time? And what that does is the trust divide get smaller and smaller and smaller. How long before they trust you? Um, I'm willing, it's about 30 seconds or a minute. After a couple, hey, you remember that one? You remember this, remember that? Hey, I'm sorry, I haven't talked to you. That type of thing. Um, make sure it's about that. And it's not about, hey, I'm in real estate. You can tell them that, but make sure you're checking in on it. And would they recommend you? And I'm willing to bet dollars to donuts that they would recommend you. So with that said, if I can tell you anything, it's number one, um, there's more leads in your memory banks than there can ever be that you could pay for. I'm going to tell you that right now. I don't care if you're not from here. Oh, by the way, Dave and I know people that make $100,000 a year on referrals. They live in Louisville, Kentucky, but they've lived all over. They just call people and they get referrals and they make 25% of 3%. It's a pretty good deal. Um, but reach out and write down everybody you know. Find people you know. Do not ever hesitate to reach out to somebody. You will be surprised, especially in this environment right now. If it is, if you have a purity of purpose and it's truly you and they know that it's you and you're not just 
if you ever heard the term, we like to use it, big boy voice. You know, just because you're in business now doesn't mean you need to say, hi, uh, good to meet you. No, be yourself. And if you do that, uh, you will prosper. And people here on this call are here to help all of you. I'll help you in any way, shape I can because um, I love people and that's what I do. And if success follows, you know what? I'm, 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 I'm fortunate. But the key is reach out to me, reach out to Dave, any of us, let me know. So if you have any questions, please, please go at it. Thank or you so teams. much, Kevin. We really appreciate that. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to go to a few techniques and methods that are going to expand on some things that Kevin talked about. But before we do that, uh, one of the questions that came in is, this is fantastic information, but it seems on it seems focused on people born locally. I'm going to cover that topic in just a minute, so don't lose sight of that. And then, but before we do that, Tasha, put my first poll in the in the field, please. So I need everybody to answer. Okay, so that's great. Everybody feels like they can farm their sphere. Now, Tasha, put the next poll in, please. Okay, so this is really important, okay? So we all feel like that we can, our, we can farm our sphere, but only about 70% of us have a CRM. So the first thing that I wanna talk about is, okay, I wanna talk about that particular topic for just a second. Because after I talk about the CRM piece, we're gonna have a conversation about how you want to create or, or build that network model that Kevin showed you inside your CRM, okay? So the, the, the first principle of this is, is there anybody who does not know what a CRM is? Okay, just in case, when I say CRM, many people call it a contact relationship manager, okay? Um, some people call it a customer relationship manager, okay? The key piece of a CRM is it is a way for you to stay in contact with and track the contact with the people you know, okay? So the kind of most rudimentary example of that that I can give, okay, which is not a great system, but it's better than none, okay, would be Microsoft Outlook. I can put everybody I know in the system. I can categorize them. I can write notes in their files. I can set appointments. I can set reminders, okay? Um, some people might use Buffini's system. Brian Buffini, who's a leading trainer in real estate, has a system for contact relationship management. In my firm, we have a corporate system for that. Um, somebody said, what CRM do you use? We happen to use a proprietary system, but prior to that, I've used Outlook. I've used Top Producer, okay? Back when I first got started in the business, I used little three by five index cards segmented into calendar days in a file box, okay? Um, does anybody on the call have a particular CRM that they really love that is available to all people in all parts of real estate? I don't want one that's company specific. If you do, just put it in chat and I'll share it with everybody. Okay, now, once you, once you have a CRM in place, if you go back to Kevin's exercise, and actually I'm gonna share my screen for a minute. 
so that I can go back to a few slides and use them to guide this discussion. So let me go back to slide one, two, three, four. Okay, right here. Okay, can you all give me just a second? Can everybody see this screen? Mm -hmm. Kevin, can you see it? Okay, so you can see this screen. So the first thing that Kevin gave you as a technique is you need to take out and think about your people in terms of circles. What I'm gonna tell you is this green circle here, okay? I want you to think of the green circle as your A circle. These are the people that you know, if an opportunity presents itself, will either refer you or do business with you. This is your really close loyalty trust group. This next circle, I want you to think of as your B circle. These are people you think will do business with you. And these are people that you would tend to do business with or refer, but you're not positive. And then everybody else is gonna be in the C group and you're gonna to have to figure out whether someday they're gonna be a B or an A. And then what Kevin said is take those people and put them in groups. Okay, so think of those groups Give me just a second. I can't see you all. Okay. Think of those groups as categories. Now, Kevin's example was families, doctors, lawyers, teachers, financial advisors, insurance, right? Okay. Let me give you some other groups. Kevin went to Center College. So he would have a category in his customer relationship manager that said Center. Okay. He also has friends that are U of L fans and UK fans. He might have a red category and a blue category. Okay. He has a category for agents. Okay. You would have a category, for example, for um, maybe you're in the PTA. So you have a PTA category. All right. So the first step is to get the people into your groups. Are they A's, B's, or C's? Then the next thing is, what are their subcategories? Now, everybody that's in a subcategory is either an A, a B, or a C. Is everybody with me so far? One of the things that I hate about these Zoom calls is a lot of people don't share their camera, so I can't tell whether they're with me or not, so I'm just going to have to keep moving, okay? Then, as you are creating those categories and you're organizing them into groups, you're going to start thinking about who are in the other categories that you might cross refer to later on. All right. So then we're going to go back to step two that Kevin gave you. We're going to make some calls. Now, one of the questions I always get asked is, well, how often should I reach out to people? What should I be doing? So before I do that, I'm going to give you a perfect example of a lack of purity of purpose call. When I first came back to Louisville, oh, by the way, the person who was from out of town that was wondering, what do you do? Let me answer that question first. Who was that? Me, Rebecca. Rebecca. Okay. So, so Rebecca, um, I came back to Louisville and I'd been in the Marine Corps for 20 years. And when I came back to Louisville, every human in the city of Louisville that I could call on the phone and say, hey, it's Dave, that would know who Dave was on the other end of the call. These are your step two calls that Kevin gave you. Every single human in Louisville, except for two, were already my sister Judy's clients. Every single one. And I built my sphere from those two people to 8,300 people in three and a half years. And I'm gonna to talk to you about how I did that in just a minute, but I'm telling you all that because what I want you to understand is that it's very, e it's not easy to do. It's a simple process that requires an application of effort, but quite honestly, how I did it is exactly what Kevin was talking about. And I'll go through that in just a second. 
But before I walk you through that process, understand, okay, that as you segment these people and you're making these calls, what I don't want your call to sound like is this one. So I come back to Louisville and I've been licensed for about three months and I get a phone call. And the phone call is somebody who says, hey, Dave, it's Bill, you know, class of 80 at St. X. Hey, how are Jenny and the kids doing? Okay, I don't remember Bill. Okay, Bill and I were never close. Bill doesn't know my wife. He's never met my kids. And he didn't tell me the reason he was calling was a business call. So the first thing I want you to understand, going back to purity of purpose, and this is what Kevin's talking about, is he's saying make these calls to people you met in middle school that you know, that you remember, that they're at least going to remember who you are, okay? And if you're making that call, that should be a very personal outreach call, and that call should not be about business. But if part of your intention of that call is to refoster your relationship and introduce the fact that you're in business, you want to tell them that very early on. So that call would sound like this. Hey, Kev, it's Dave. How you doing? Great. Hey, listen, man, I'm calling because quite honestly, I've gotten a hey, new business. Hey, where have you been, Dave? I hadn't heard from you in 20 years. I know, and I got in this new business. I'm really excited about it. What I wanted to do is just try to reconnect. Would that be okay? Hey, that'd be great. Okay, and then we're going to have our conversation. If Kevin says, Dave, I don't like to do business with friends, I'm going to say, hey, not a problem. Is it okay if I just stay in touch and see how you're doing? And I'm not going to talk about business unless he then says to me to talk about business. Everybody follow that. Okay, all right. So when you make these calls, the calls are to the people that you know well enough that they're going to remember you some. If your purpose is to build a business relationship, tell them. I'm in a new industry. I'm trying to do some outreach. Okay. All right. I'll never forget. I was at a charity event about 20 years ago, 19 years ago, and I'm sitting at a charity poker table and Will Wolford and Daryl Isaacs are sitting next to me and we're playing charity poker. I don't know Will Wolford from Adam. Okay. We went to the same high school. He was five years behind me. We don't run in the same circles. Okay. Two or three years later, he reached out to me because he, he decided to go into the insurance business for a while. And when he reached out to me, he said, hey, Dave, you probably don't remember me. We were at a charity poker event. I wanted to take a minute to talk to you about business. Is that okay? Yes or no? Okay. Because he had purity of purpose. He told me what he was, I was more than happy to have the call. But if you call me and give me some song and dance about my kids and my grandma, and you want to talk to me about business, I'm done with you. Okay, you got to be real. You got to be genuine. Everybody with me. Now, then what you're going to do is you're going to take that group of A's. And about every three days. Until you run out of them. You're going to reach out to two or three of them. Not 20, not 30, not 50, two or three. And then. After that call, depending on how it goes, you're going to set yourself a reminder in your customer relationship manager. And if you don't have anything else for now, do it on your Outlook or Google can calendar. Touch base again with and those three people's names. That call should happen every 90 days at a minimum for the rest of your life. All of your A's get a touch every 90 days. But you don't sit down on one day and call 40 people. You spread them out. When you run out of A's, you're going to go to do the same thing with B's. And then the next thing you're going to learn to do is ask them, as you develop relationships, for one or two people in specific in a perfect world, in specific industries that you'd like to meet, or one or two people that you think might benefit from getting referrals from a realtor. That you can introduce yourself to. 
Once you've exhausted that group, then you're going to, next time you talk to him or Sarah, there are a couple of people that I could introduce myself to. And that process will grow your list from two to 8,300 very, very quickly. Because if you think about it, I'm not going to go through this whole exercise, but just follow me. Two twos is four. Two fours is eight. Two eights is 16. 32, 64, 128. You get the process, 256. See how fast that grows? So if every 90 days I was doubling my database, my God, it'd be so big I couldn't manage it in two or three years. What if I only doubled it every six months? Still in five or six years, it'd be massive. Is everybody with me? Okay, so when you were asking about how to grow your sphere when you aren't local, okay, you're going to do it the same method, but you're going to cultivate the relationships that you already make. So in other words, and who was it that asked that again? Was that Beverly? No. I don't see it your was name. me, Rebecca. Rebecca, I'm sorry. Your name is not on your, it says iPad. So I apologize that I couldn't remember your name. So Rebecca, okay. when you go out and meet people, okay, everybody you meet, you want to get to know them from the perspective of, this goes back to Kevin's point, not how can I help you as a realtor? How can I help you? Who would you like to be introduced to? Okay, how many of you have been to a networking event your broker told you, hey, go out and do some networking or another agent said, hey, you should go to these networking events. And when you're there, you're trying to introduce yourself to people and give them your business card. Everybody who's done that before, raise your hand. Tell the truth. Okay. All right. That is the last thing in the world you want to be your objective at a networking event. Here's what your objective of a networking event should be. How can I meet two or three people that want to be introduced to other people I might know or come in contact with? This is called being a connector. Because the power of being a connector is this. And this is going to be a full circle conversation of our conversation today. What Kevin didn't tell you is that part of the reason that he and I have had such a great relationship over the last 25 years is because for each other, we have been connectors. When I needed somebody in Louisville to do something and I didn't know who to call, I called Kevin and asked him who I should reach out to. When Kevin traveled around the country and he didn't know what realtors to reach out to or he needed advice on realtors or mortgage, he called me. That relationship of helping each other grow is what fostered our, beyond the fact that we had trust from our time in the Marine Corps, beyond the fact that we had a lot of mutual respect, it was that constant back and forth and ebb and flow over that period of time that really built our relationship. And quite honestly, never from anything other than reciprocity, right? And it's the thing that led me one day to be sitting and he and I are talking about him coming back to Louisville and six weeks later, I'd had somebody approach me about a job. And the whole time I'm interviewing this person, I'm saying, why am I not calling Kevin Trimble? Well, that's what this building your sphere is all about. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? It's about do for others. It's about give to others. It's about every time you meet somebody, figure out who they want to be introduced to. OK, one of the most powerful things I've learned in networking events is I'll go to a networking event and I'll talk to somebody. And as I'm talking to them, all I'm really thinking about is who would they like to know that I know? And every year or so, somebody will call me and say, hey, I wanted to thank you for that introduction to so and so six years ago. And oh, by the way. This person's getting in the real estate business. I told them to come see you. Or this person wants to rent an apartment. Do you have anybody that can help them? Or this person wants to sell a house. Would you like an introduction? All that stuff pays forward. Is everybody with me? Okay, so step one, you got to get your people into their A, B, and C group. A is the people you know 
or believe will do business with you or will refer you if the opportunity presents itself. Your B group is people you believe might, but you're not sure. Your C group is the people you don't know about. You're not sure yet. You're trying to move your C's to your B's and your B's to your A's. If they're in the A group, you've got to touch them at a minimum on the phone every 90 days, minimum, forever, for the rest of your life. How do you do that? You split them into small groups and you set yourself reminders 90 days out, okay? Now, the next piece is get permission to drip on them because visibility leads to credibility, which leads to profitability. Goes back to what Kevin said. If they don't know you're in the business, how would they know to help you? But nobody wants you calling them on the phone saying, hey, Betsy, it's Dave. You know anybody wants to sell a house? You know anybody wants to buy a house? Can I help anybody sell a house? Nobody wants that. You wouldn't want that, right? Nobody wants the person that's at the cocktail party and you say something about, they, about real estate and say, well, by God, I'm good. I'll tell you, boy, well, the market's hot. And I'm going to tell you, when you need somebody, I want you to come here. Can I give you my... People don't want that, right? Now, don't get me wrong. You can make money being that brutish if you do it enough every day. And there are teachers out there that teach you that method. I can't help you with that one. That doesn't have any purity of purpose for me. Okay? What I believe and what Kevin believes is if I spend my time developing and farming my network by helping others grow themselves and their business, it'll come back to me tenfold in the long run. And if you think about it, here's the other reason it'll come back to you by such a large proportion. How many people that you could help grow their business have a transaction that has a higher per transaction cost than real estate? Very few. So when you help the person who cuts grass get referrals, you're helping them with a 20 or 30 or $50 a month, 10 or 15 time a year deal. But that same person is coming in contact with people that have 150, 200, 300, 400 thousand dollar potential transactions down the road. Is everybody with me? Okay, I want to open it up for just a few minutes and see if anybody has any specific questions about techniques, methods, et cetera. If you want to, you're welcome to unmute and ask them, or if you need to put them in chat, Tasha and I will try to watch those for you, but I can't find the chat for some reason. So Tasha, you're gonna have to help me. All right, we have a question from Frank. Um, how often should we drip emails and how often should we drip postcards and mailers? Okay, so the first thing is, I want to go back to purity of purpose, all right? It depends on what you're sending, all right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell a story on myself once. I got this bright idea about 15 years ago that we were going to have a vendor create an email campaign, and we were going to let all of our agents send it out on an automatic basis every month, and it looked exactly the same. And one day I got a call from somebody who was totally irate because he got the same email from 15 different people in 15 minutes. So my answer, Frank, is if you're just going to send out some canned something that's not personal, that's not customized in any way, don't even do it. Don't waste your time. Get over it. But if you have a system or a method that allows you to take a generic process and customize it a little bit, then I think at a minimum, if they're in your A group, you probably want them to get something once a month. Perfect example. There are plenty of places out there. You know, our, we have these things kind of built into our system, but if you're in a firm that doesn't have them, there's vendors out there that will provide them for you, okay? Where you drop a newsletter every month about what's going on in the real estate business. But if it's just gonna be the generic newsletter, don't waste your time. You want a newsletter that has customizable content and you want your customizable content at the top. If you're not going to take the time to customize that content, don't waste your time. If you're not going to customize the content every month, don't waste your time. Okay. Another really good thing to send out is a market area report or some kind of information specific to what's going on with them. So there's all kinds of systems out there. 
Um, we use a system, for example, that if you want to, it can send you the value of your house every month or it can send you what's sold in your neighborhood every month. Those types of things have some value. Um, but for example, I, I, our, our system has a Cinco de Mayo card, okay? All right, I'm not sending Cinco de Mayo cards to 8,300 people. I don't speak Spanish. I don't have a lot of people in my sphere that do speak Spanish. I think it's a completely disingenuous thing to do that. Okay, if I was going to send out holiday greetings, I'm either going to send a generic holiday greeting or I'm going to send Merry Christmas to all my Catholic clients and I'm going to send Happy Hanukkah to all my Jewish clients. But I'm not going to send Merry Christmas to my Jewish clients. That's so the point is you have to be really intentional about these things. But in a perfect world, the best trainers in the country, I think, would tell you, you want a personal touch every 90 days minimum. That's a phone call, a face-to-face, -face, a Zoom call. That's minimum, okay? And you want something that drips on them monthly, but it has to be genuine. It has to be from you, sound like you, look like you, be you. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, what other questions do we have? We have about seven or eight minutes. Um, I'm not sure if this has been answered yet, but how often should we call the B group 90 days or longer? And we also have a question um, from Bonnie. Will you, pre will you please repeat the visibility lead to? Okay, so visibility leads to credibility, which leads to profitability. Okay, all right. So the whole point is, like this is a perfect example. Let's go back to Frank's example. If I was going to send my A and B group something to increase my visibility, I would be sending them my just listed or I wouldn't call them just listed. I would call them new to the market, okay? Nobody wants you to list anything. You list on Angie's list, it costs nothing, it pays nothing, okay? You market, you present, you advocate, okay? But I would send all my A's for sure as I was trying to grow my visibility, I would send them my new to the market, either postcards or e-greetings or however you wanna do that. And then uh, do the same thing. If you, for example, I don't know how many of you know Tracy French, but she's a rock star in real estate. One of the things she does is she posts on her social media the family when they get their new home, congratulating them on their new home. Now, her silent message is, I'm pretty good at this. But she always gears it around them. It's not about her. Hey, I'm so happy for Bill and Sue or whatever the case may be. Okay. So did that answer the VCP question? Visibility leads to credibility, leads to profitability. Okay. And then the other question, Tasha, was what I apologize. Uh, how often should we call the B group? 90 days or longer? Okay. So, so the first thing is, if you know the B group, you can put them on the same cycle. If you don't know the B group, Okay, you actually need to call them a little bit more often on the front end to determine whether or not they're going to let you engage with them. Okay, so let me explain what I mean by that. Um, so if they're already in my sphere, I know them, they know who I am, they understand who I am, then that 90 day cycle is going to work great. Okay, but let's just assume for the sake of argument that B person is someone who you met last week at a networking event who said they were thinking about doing something in the next 90 days in real estate. And you think you have a chance of building a relationship with them, but you're not sure they're still a B, but they're not really inside your sphere yet. Right? So that person, you're going to have to touch a few more times before you determine what cycle you're going to put them on. Does everybody understand what I mean by that? Hey, Dave, can I answer a previous question for Rebecca sure. in a different way? Hey, Rebecca, you asked about being from out of town, and here's something to think about is, number one, I told you about the referral. You've got a sphere from your life. 
some point, it may be hard to, to, to mine that, um, but try to do that. But then the next thing is this. Everybody think about your key passions. Dave mentioned category, UK fan, U of L fan. Um, but there are, you know, there are key passions that don't matter. You know, who's a runner? Who's a weightlifter? Who's a, who's a fly fisherman? Um, so uh, uh, Neil Robinson is on this call with us. And I know for a fact that Neil Robinson um, was in the banking business and the restaurant business. Okay. Um, those are icebreakers. Those are natural icebreakers. And then here's the last thing, Rebecca, to think about. And I say this to anybody that's new and understanding. Think about this math equation. 0% of 3% is less than 50% of 3%. And the reason I bring that up is this. You see a lot of people struggling and, you know, they kind of just give up. So I've done a poll in the last six months of talking to successful people that at one time were in the real estate business. And most of their success was not in the real estate business. And to a person, um, here's the key, the, the, the key anecdote I uh, took away from it. I said, knowing what you know now, what would you have done different um, when you were starting your real estate career? And all of them said, if I would have known that, he said, I would have found a successful, and I'm not talking the top agent in the company, but I would have found a more experienced agent who maybe had some, uh, 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 capabilities that um, I could help offset their weaknesses. They could help offset my strengths. But more importantly, I would find an experienced agent and I would say, listen, I'll wash your car. I'll drive you to where you got to go. I'll show every house you need. I'll do anything if you just teach me. And those things you'll see the, the successful agents that, that keep going. And this goes back to Rebecca about being out of town is find somebody that knows about town. Rebecca, oh, yeah. you've got to you, you got a talent that uh, we don't know about yet. I mean, have you ever met the person that's great at engaging people, but then when it comes to filling out the contract, they're like, rut row. You know, go ask if you have an admin in your brokerage or we ours is called agent services. Go ask them and say, who, what agent brings in the most contracts, but they're terrible. They're not really good at the paperwork. Well, if you can find that person, Get good at the paperwork and work a deal and learn from them. That's how you do that. And then you'll build your sphere that way as well. So with that, Dave, that's all I have right now. That's perfect, Kevin. Hey, listen, me, I want I want to thank Kevin for taking his time with us today. I want to tell you, you do not know the number of hours he spent helping prepare these slides and thinking through this. Um, we were down in Barron River the other night and at one o'clock in the morning. He's in there tweaking these slides. Yesterday, he and Tasha were tweaking them again. I want to thank Tasha for all her hard work. And Tasha, can you share with us again what our topic is for our next Accelerate program? Um, we have non-real estate conversations that build relationships. Now, listen, oh, that's, one to look forward that's to. the next step of this conversation, right? How do I have the non-real estate conversation? that leads to building relationships. So here's what I want you to do. Over this next 30 days, start creating your A's, B's, and C's. Go have some of these step one and step two calls and compare the difference. And then when we get together the next time, we're gonna actually do some dialogue. We're gonna do some role play. We're gonna play with this method. I appreciate everybody. I hope you have a great month and we'll see you in about four weeks.